out just a little bit. Okay. So, what we're going to end with this semester is building feature parameters. So what we did last couple of weeks, or just last week actually, was just talk about context-free grammars. And we built some of our own simple grammars and talked about how these are very useful in detecting um, different ideas. Um, uh, yes, that's fine. We, uh, as soon as I break, we can talk about final projects. Um, so we talked about creating a, a parsed set of parsed trees and using noun phrases and verb phrases to, to detect entities and sentences. And then we can also get into sentiment if we think about how verbs are the drivers of a sentence. They're the head of a sentence. Okay. However, context-free grammar does ignore the flavor of the sentence, so the context, because it's context-free, right? So it's just creating noun phrases and verb phrases, ignoring the semanticity of the pieces in the sentence. But now we can extend that into a feature-based grammar, which gives us a lot more flexibility to do entity and relation detection, um, which can be really useful for developing and understanding how much people like different systems. Because if we think about this as a sentiment problem, you might want to know if things are, in, in a text, if they're comparing two products, which one they've said is positive and which one they've said is negative. That sort of thing. Uh, do we have a notebook to include all regular grammars? Uh, you mean like every word combination in the last one, the last lecture? Is that what you mean? I'm not sure, totally sure exactly what you mean. And that could be because my brain is fried. <clears throat> uh, no. I mean, you can take the one from class. I, essentially, what I thought you would do, at least for the Chapter 8 homework, is take the one from class and edit it, basically. So copy that one from the notebook from Chapter 8 and then use that as your starting point. Well, so we're going to extend those context-free grammars and get more control. And so we're going to talk about feature structures. And this really, if you've had a class on SQL um, and databases and tables, this will be very familiar to you. So how do we build more complex structures um, given that we know that context is important? All right. So we've spent all semester talking about grammatical slots and how they are the driver of what can and cannot go in a specific area of a sentence. Um, and when we did, got to classification, that became the feature extraction that we were using. So pulling out those features was the interesting question of what can we classify with, it's positive or it's negative or it's a statement or it's um, girl or boy, right? We had to pull the features out first. And that's considered a feature extractor because you told it what features to find um, and then um, coded it as sort of a yes-no relationship. So for an example, we used one as uh, true-false. It contained the word, um, uh, what was one of our, our words, our terrible uh, idiotic, I think was one of the words that denoted a negative sentiment for those movie reviews. Right? Um, and so that would contain the word true. Uh, now, instead of extracting those features, we're just going to say, here are the features that define this sort of grammar. So uh, this isn't technically a training problem because the training that you do is written into the grammar. So most parser systems, which is what we're still doing, are uh, the training is written in by the, by the human. 
So let's get an idea here. We've got uh, NLTK, and we're just creating a really simple example of um, where the uh, cat, right? Cat is literally meow meow cat, right? Is um, is part of the noun phrase. The uh, person that's doing the chasing is Kim, and we're refer referring to them as K. Okay. So Kim is chasing a cat. This is the uh, actor and the reference. Okay, so this is a little dictionary of what Kim is doing in the sentence. Chase is the verb, so it's category. I'm sorry, this is not meow meow. This is uh, category. It's a noun phrase. Um, the category here is a verb. Uh, its orthography could be chased, as in the past tense, and its ref uh, relative um, it's lemma, right, is chase. Okay. This will be a simple system of, of defining what words mean. So a more complex system might be word, something like word net. So let me see, what was I looking up on word net? Hopefully it wasn't embarrassing. Wing. Right. So here's the definition for wing. Let's see if I can get it to only display, like, simple stuff. Um, unfortunately, this gives me everything. Let's um, hide all. Just kind of give us the option for wing here. There we go. So here would be a simple definition or dictionary for the word wing. Okay, so it's got all these different senses. If I click on one of them, oh man, WordNet's running slow. I can see it's um, different pieces. So essentially what we're doing here is defining, writing a, a literal dictionary of all of the different pieces that might be related to it. So a direct uh, hyponym for wing might be, there we go, uh, for wing, halter, balancer. This looks like it's like wings like flying. Right? So that's essentially what we're trying to do is build in the, the structure of an individual word and its possible uh, parameters. Okay. So these two variables have a couple of shared categories or features, cat, which is grammatical category and not meow cat, because I just gave a different lecture and it was meow cat, sorry. Um, orthography, which is the spelling of the possible different spellings of the word. And a semanticity argument, ref for referent and rel for relation. This is an example of a rule-based grammar okay. or feature grammar because we're building in these key value pairs of feature structures. Okay. And at first it seems like, okay, we're writing a dictionary. But the extension of what you do with this is what makes it really interesting. Okay. So feature structures are designed to, to create dictionaries or lexicons. Um, you don't have to have a ton of different things. It might not be useful, but this is where it's very handy if your, maybe your job or your, your data that you're processing has a set set of, of words that are important to your company. So for example, um, we might, in, in being in academics, I have sort of three pieces to my job. It's like teaching and then research and then service. Those might be the feature structures that I would apply to uh, scanning people's emails. Like, which email should this go into? Well, its category is going to be this one's research, this one's teaching, this one's kind of both. I don't know, what do I do with that? Okay. So the, the properties are very flexible. They're defined by the research, by you. Okay. Uh, but there are some general rules if your only goal is for parsing. Okay. So verbs have semantic roles. If you use chase as a verb, so let's say I chased my dog out of the Christmas trees today, so our house is next to a Christmas tree farm, sometimes when we're out walking around, she decides to go frolicking through the trees <laughs> because there are bunnies. So let's say I use the word chase. The subject of the sentence is the agent, so I am the agent, the actor, right? So I was chasing her, but well, it could be that she was chasing bunnies. The object of the sentence is patient. I don't love these terms, agent and patient. They're very common. I always use actor and actee. 
So the person who's doing the acting and the person who the acting is being done upon, you can pick your favorite words here. Person acting, person receiving could also work. So the object of that sentence will be Abby, my dog. So I chased Abby. Um, and so that word chase requires a, an object. You don't just say I chased. I guess you could, but people would be like, you chased what? So anytime you have a sort of what moment, we're talking about direct objects, then we might want to code that that verb requires such a thing. Okay. So this might be really useful, let's say, for de designing a chat box system. So let's say we're building a, an intelligent um, response system, and you're coding in what their responses could be, you might need to, to, to note that the, a verb like chase, which I don't guess a chat box would use, but a verb like chase requires a subject and an object. Okay. So we can just add more features. Now chase requires an agent, which is the subject of a sentence. It requires a patient or an act, an actor, which requires an object. Okay. So this will let me know if I'm using my intelligent speaking system that that sentence must have both of those terms. So let's take a sentence, Kim Chase Lee. We can bind together the actor and actee's roles to this object. So now I can start talking about referencing um, and entity relations. So we would link the reference feature of the noun phrase um, to the reference feature in the second noun phrase, past to the verb. So the one before it would be the referent for subject, and the one after it would be the referent for object. And this does assume some very simple sentences. Obviously, complexity becomes a problem very fast in this, in this example. So let's take the sentence, Kim Chase Lee. I'm going to tokenize that bad boy just by using split, because it's a nice, easy sentence. We're going to build the Lee structure. Okay. So its category is a noun phrase. Its orthography is spelling, L-E-E. -E. Its referent is L. Okay. So now I could take each of these words, and they have their own dictionaries. Okay. And so we could write ourselves a little function that reads in the individual words and essentially splits out the orthography. This is a great way to translate between case and different forms of the same word, so verbs and their conjugations. Okay. So lexical um, to or functional, I think, is what the F is supposed to stand for. So, so for each of the words in Kim Chit Lee Chase, um, if the orthography equals the word, um, spit it back out. So I can assign this to a subject, a verb, and an object. Right? So um, what I'm doing is creating little uh, dictionary variables that are um, that are translated through my little function that I wrote. And so let's go back and look at. Um, what is tokens? Like, what are all these variables? So remember, tokens is just the individual words. Okay. Here, it's taking those uh, dictionaries and looping over them. So here, this might be the dictionary of every word ever. Okay, right now, we're keeping it simple. And it's essentially only going to give us back the orthography of the word. Okay. Or the orthography is the way it's printed. All right, so if you see the orthography of the word, return it. Give it back to me. Here we're translating, and so we're just doing one token at a time. Um, so this is essentially saying the subject of the sentence is the first word. The verb in the sentence is the second word. The object in the sentence is the third word. Okay, because it's 0, 1, 2, for 1, 2, 3. By creating these, I now can add more and more to the dictionary. So the verb here, its agent or its actor, is now the subject that we just defined. The uh, actee or the patient for the verb is now the object that we just defined. 
these are little references. Um, here, like, it looks kind of interesting because, let me show you. We're creating this really complex kind of system. Oops, that's spell wrong? Print subject, less to, oh, right, oh, bar, hold on. Sorry, I forgot to rerun everything. Essentially what we're doing is we're creating these nested dictionaries. And so that's why I said if, you, uh, if you're familiar with SQL and databases, this will hopefully make a little sense. Um, if you're not, I'll still hopefully make sense. Um, here we are. Okay. So I have a dictionary for each one of these words. And what this one is doing is it's giving, it's spitting back out the dictionary. So it's essentially finding that dictionary and assigning it to uh, a separate dictionary. So now it should print. It's still mad at me. Why is it? None type is not subscriptable. Okay, fine. Be that way. Okay, what am I doing today that that is not running? Did I get an error somewhere else? Let's try again. Okay, ran, 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 ran. Okay, why are the notes? It's just, it just doesn't like me today. Excellent. Okay, well, we'll just trust the output down here uh, because this is apparently being dumb. But I can define the subject, verb, and object as the first word, second word, third word. And what this thing is doing here is saying, it's not just the first word, it's this entire first word's dictionary. Now once I have that, I can relate the verb and the subject and the verb and the object. And now for the Kim, I can print out the entire like connection of everything that's going on in the sentence. So the orthography is chased, because it's Kim chased Lee. The sort of lemma of the word uh, or the semanticity, the relation, is the word chase. This would be the, the root form. The agent is Kim, and the patient is Lee. So now I've connected um, the, the object of the sentence to the uh, actor in the sentence. Okay. This system, though, is like just how you might think about it. Because obviously we don't want to have to do this for every single token or every single sentence. We want to do this in a more uh, flexible way. Uh, this is just an idea of how one might have coded this in computer terms rather than just like drawing this out by hand. Okay. And so the, the labels here are arbitrary. You can use actor and actee. Some of them are, are um, some of them are commonly used because it's just a common term in linguistics, but they are not prescriptive, okay, meaning they have to be these terms. Okay. So the label is going to just really depend on the verb type. Okay. So you might use source and experiencer for surprise. Okay. Now careful here. Um, because every time you use a different label, you're now introducing more complexity into the system. So cre keeping it at the like simpler labels is going to be better for everyone and your brain. But um, essentially, that's why I like act, act, act or the thing that's doing the verb's action, and act e the thing that the verb's action is being acted upon, um, because then. That allows me to use the same ones for surprise, because there is a person that is the source of the surprise, the actor, the thing that's doing the verb. They are surprising you. And the actee, the thing that the verb is being acted upon, you're the one that's being surprised. So if you say, he surprised me, I can still use the same structure of actor. He's doing the surprising. I'm being surprised. Okay. Um, because once I start to add more of these sort of semantic variations, I now have to code all of them and know when it's this one and when it's that one. So if we can pick global terms that apply for all um, nouns and verbs, which may not be possible, uh, this works a little better. Okay. All right. The, the real flavor of this. So why would we do this? This would really be allow us to build a system 
the two options. One is the goal is to build a system that can talk, in a sense, that can create grammatical sentences that have, for example, syntactic agreement. Or it could be to use this to break down sentences to understand these complexities in language, to look at the, the entity relations between objects, which, if you're interested in some uh, sentiment, can be really important because it might be that you break everything down in these sort of feature grammars and then look at the, the reference. Right? So uh, I have a whole bunch of reviews on the new uh, Mac Pros, which look amazing. Um, people are joking that they look like cheese graters. right? Uh, but I can take all the reviews and all the comments on that and break them down and think about uh, if I'm reading like something on CNET, which is a text source, they might be comparing it to someone else. And so if I use the bag of words approach, which is the, the most sentiment analysis, just kind of throws all the words in and adds up the number of positive ones, I'm going to miss the fact that they might be saying that this new thing is crap and this other thing that's already in existence is great, but because there are so many positive words about the competitor, you would miss that fact. Okay, so this would allow us to um, really detect these differences in um, relation and make sure we understand that the positive words are related to X and the negative words are related to Y. Or it could be a normal scene that article they talk about how much they hate everything. <laughs> and then either approach would work. Okay. So bring this down to a simpler question. Let's think about subject verb agreement. This is uh, incredibly complex for computers to understand and uh, non-native speakers. Okay. Um, so I speak terrible French. And I'm, I don't have problems with the, the, the plurals, but I have a lot of trouble with gender. Like, is this male? Is it female? Can I call it they? Right? So um, other languages have different syntactic agreement problems, and it might be gender, gender matching. Okay. In English, we don't have gender uh, nouns, so instead we just use uh, markers for plurality. So you could say this dog, legally, but you should not say these dog, singular. You should say these dogs, uh, plural, and not this dogs. Okay. Unless it's possessive, that's a different story. Okay. So how do we get a computer to understand that these are, which one's valid and which one's not? Because uh, maybe we're trying to write a system to speak or just to pull these apart. Uh, and so the biggest problem here is if we use a very simple context-free grammar, this is a determinant or this pronoun, filler, right? Um, a dog is a noun phrase, and so our very simple rules for context grammar would never understand that these dog is incorrect, okay? because it still fits those grammatical roles. So how do we write a system that understands a match between the, the, the determinants and the nouns? or the, the, term, the nouns and the verbs, because we still got to match uh, the verb to the plurality of the noun. Okay. So here's some more examples for subject-verb agreement with what I would consider one of English's most obnoxious conjugation rules, which is third-person present tense. So uh, the dog runs, like I run, you run, they run, we run, he or she runs with an S, that little sneaky S, right? This is something that second, third, fourth language learners have a lot of trouble with because it's dumb. Um, so I'm on your side. But how, how do I know it should be the and not a, okay? uh, or um, both dog, right, would not be correct. And then runs, how should it be, why should it be runs? But if it's the dogs, plural, it's the dogs runs with no S. Okay. So we have example runs, so singular runs, plurals run. Okay. So capturing that 
in a context-free grammar is nearly impossible because all of these would be valid because it would only be looking at part of speech, determinant, uh, noun, verb, done. Right. So now we, we're adding flavor to our context-free grammar by using a feature-based grammar. Um, so this is kind of the same thing. If we code this as a context-free grammar, it becomes sentence is a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Noun phrase is a determinant and a noun. The verb phrase is a verb. And then here we've got our determinant, this, our noun, dog, uh, verb, runs. But our determinant might also be this or these. And then a noun might be dog or dogs. The verb might be run or runs. And it would mix and match and say that they were all legal. Because in our grammar, they would be legal. Okay. And so we could generate incorrect sentences, such as this dog, uh, this dog runs. Um, that, this dog runs, this dog runs, I don't, this dog runs is legal. These dog runs, these dog runs. Either way, we can generate some incorrect sentences. If you're trying to write an intelligent speech system, you don't want to do that. Right? So if you're trying to write Siri, this is not a good idea. Okay. And so how, I guess what I'm building to is how we can write these grammar codes to, to handle this. Okay. And mainly the answer is to add more complexity. And all semester have been like, the simplest rules are the best. Na naive Bayes is pretty simple, but it works. Right. Now, to create complex system, we do have to add more complexity. Okay. So, simplest way to add complexity is to simply add different codes. So we can create a feature grammar that looks a lot like our context-free grammar, <clears throat> but it has these extra little codes. Okay, so a sentence is a noun phrase that is singular with a verb phrase that is singular, or it's a noun phrase plural, verb phrase plural, plural. A singular noun phrase becomes a singular determinant and a singular noun. A noun phrase is plural, is plural, plural. Verb phrase is singular, is just singular, plural is plural. And now I have this, these, dog. Okay. And now this dog is always combined and these dogs never is combined. Or these dog is never combined. Okay. And it keeps going. Okay. That's pretty cool. It should work pretty well. Except now imagine this at scale. Okay. Every possible combination of singular and plural uh, would have to be coded and this gets really heavy really fast so this becomes a, a essentially an uh, a complex very large system which maybe we don't want to code every single combination so there's got to be a simpler way and there is um, essentially all we're doing is adding extra keys okay. that doubles the grammar size which doesn't, isn't a huge deal until you realize that just the simplest 2,000 words in English, this would be an incredibly long system. So how can we deal with the fact that this becomes a combinatorics problem without essentially blowing up our computers? And this is where we're going to do this. So these are attributes and constraints. So there's a special type of gram feature grammar system that allows us to build uh, dictionaries for word types and uh, match based on their attributes. Okay. So we could do something like this is a noun where its number is plural or this is a noun where the number is plural. Essentially this is what we're saying. Okay. But this is what the code might look like. Now on these, the shorthand here I actually don't suggest using the shorthand because unless you've just done this for a long time or you're copying, um, trying to improve on a system that's already in place because, uh, you know, I could write it like this or what I could do is write it like this. There we go. 
Now, this is valid code. This is not because of the spaces in its text, but this is also valid code and so much easier to read. This is a noun or its number is plural. Okay, so you can use a shorthand. I'm using it to match the book. But my personal preference when I, when I very rarely write these, but when I write these things is I try to spell them all out. Because then later I'm not going as cat, meow cat, or as cat category. Like, and I forget, okay? So, you, as long as you're using valid variable naming, um, you can call it the full name. So we might say a determinant where its number is singular might be these, this, this. A determinant where the number is plural might be these. Uh, singular noun, plural noun, singular, plural. Okay, excuse me. And this is the same amount of length that I had to do before, but we can shorthand the grammar part. So this part, the, the defining of the words, does not really get any shorter. However, the definition of the grammar does get shorter. Okay. So why would I do this sort of thing? Um, it's because it allows me to, to match. So a sentence is a noun phrase where the noun phrase is number and this question mark in is a special character, so leave that bad boy alone, um, is that though that matches across all objects in a noun phrase. Okay. So here's the definition of noun phrase. And the noun phrase is that the, the numeric component has to match, and so the determinant has to be the same as the noun. So that means uh, the determinant here, where the number is singular, will only get paired with the singular um, nouns. And the plural nouns here will only get paired with the plural ones. So by using this sort of code with these question mark ends, we essentially reduced every possible combination of singular and plural and whatever else we want to use. Um, nouns don't get that complicated, but verbs do. Um, now we're just essentially saying it has to match all the way across. Okay. The uh, numeric component of the determinant has to match the numeric component of the noun. And there might be other things that you want to match on as well. We'll get to this for verbs. Okay. Now the verb phrase is just that the um, verb has to have um, a numeric match. Now this is just a verb. We could say it has to match the noun phrase verb. But we haven't got uh, the noun phrase uh, noun. Okay, so they have to be all the same all the way across. Okay, so up here, whatever noun phrase fills in for uh, question mark n, if it's singular, that now gets applied to the verb phrase as well. So this allows us to do both syntactic agreement of determinant and noun, but also noun to verb. So this becomes three lines of code rather than um, many lines of code saying it always has to be plural or it always has to be singular. And that is slick because now I've solved the problem of syntactic agreement and subject verb matching. So the question mark in, is, like I said, leave that alone, is a variable. I think it can be question mark anything, but it helps if you just leave it as question mark in that gets filled in based on whatever num is defined as. So it could be single, it could be plural. Uh, and by using that formatting, we're restricting them to all have the same feature set. So essentially, it, it subsets the data and says only the ones that are all single, or only the ones that are all plural. Don't mix and match. And so um, this is what uh, my I'm trying to remember what this picture is. So it will pair this dog and these dogs. All right, and it will not pair these dogs together. Okay. And so now, where the noun phrase is singular, you get this dog. When it's plural, you get these dogs. Okay. You will not get this combination or that combination because they don't match anymore.
Then when you build the entire sentence, you will always get a noun phrase that is plural, so that plural is applied to both, or that singular is applied to both, which then also carries over to the verb phrase where it's plural. So you get these dogs run, or this dog runs, but you never get the mix and match of singular and plural together, which is what we want. So that's a really um, taking an intricate, very intricate system and really condensing it down to like just the features, they got to match. Um, however, there's always a however, I feel like, because English, like I said, it's dumb. Okay. If we have more strict rules, this would be easier, but then it becomes less of a fun problem. Okay. So some, some determinants don't care. They shrug. Like the, or some, or any, or many. No, these words don't care. So the nice thing about this system is that it's ex it, it, it extends to using question mark n as the placeholder. Before, we had defined this as singular or plural. But now, this could be anything that matches. Like, eh, whatever. It's sort of like a star. And that star means like can be can be paired, however, not picky, is the way I think about it. Okay. Um, and so the, some, and any can be combined with singular or plural. So this allows us a, a third flexible category here of eh, whatever is effectively what it is. Okay. Move myself some water here. I have yapped too much today. <clears throat> All right. So they're not picky. Moving on. Okay. So here's how we might use this. So we're gonna load in <clears throat> a feature grammar from the book and that has already been written to handle. <clears throat> this sort of system in the, the way that we have described it. We're going to split up Kim likes children. We're loading this parser. Okay. And this just tells it to load the specific book grammar. This came down as we downloaded NLTK. Okay. Trace equals two here. I will leave that on because if your um, grammar fails, which more than likely when you write it for this chapter, you will have something that breaks because we're, none of us are experts at this. And I can only make it marginally work half the time because I have not spent years working on it. <clears throat> so um, always include this trace option so that you can get some sort of printout. <laughs> um, and that's actually really handy for chapter eight as well. You can add this trace option to the parsers so that you can um, at least get some output. Because sometimes when they don't work, they just print nothing. And you're sort of left going, did I do something wrong? Or is it the code wrong? Like, there's no error. Okay. Anyway, so for the parse tree, because there might be more than one, we're going to parse our tokens here. And what we can see is it is saying, OK, we got Kim, we've got likes, we've got children. This is a feature bottom up, so this is a, a shift reduce parser. Okay. And what it's doing is it's saying, okay, I got this proper noun, okay, prop noun here being meaning it's a name usually, and it's singular, okay. And then the next word I'm going to see um, is this singular verb likes. So I'm going to say, okay, well, that's a noun phrase because I only need a noun for that, so I'm going to pop that and make it into a noun phrase, and that noun phrase is singular. Okay. Uh, the next thing that's going to come is some sort of verb phrase, but it's got to be singular, because question mark n becomes singular. Then we get a TV, which is for transitive verb. Um, that's for singular nouns, and is in the present tense, so likes with an S. That verb phrase um, has got to have the same singular noun and the same tense, 
So it's like trying to find the, all that combinations. And we've got children for plural, and that's okay here. Okay. And so it creates at the very bottom here um, the sentence. Uh, I can try. I have that. Short answer. Um, I don't think I have tree saved. CP I think it would be CP. The CP dot draw. See if it has the draw option. Okay, feature chart parser does not draw. So this particular one does not draw. If you had one that did, you could. Um, it kind of has it down here. So it has sentence. It tells you that the noun, the sentence is a singular noun with a proper noun, which is Kim. The verb phrase is a transitive singular present tense verb, likes. And then the last noun phrase here is a plural noun, which is children. And so it kind of has a drawn here, but not in the like tr nice, pretty parse tree structure. All right. So when we decide to build these, we do have to figure out that feature extraction. Okay. So how can we decide what features are necessary for our grammar? So we would think about atomic values. So atomic values are things that can't be broken down anymore. Like I can't break down singular and plural anymore. They just are. Okay. And generally we make these sort of things as um, true false, so Boolean. Okay. Um, and so for example here, a verb that has a present tense. So tense here is um, multiple options, present, past, future. There's more than that. It's past participle, right? So there's there's a couple more, but if you think about present, past, and future, that'll get you on the right page. But here, this auxiliary tag, its options are yes, no. So instead of using aux equals yes or aux equals no, we can simply do plus aux or minus aux. And what that tells it is that this particular word needs an auxiliary noun phrase. So I can blah 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 so it needs um i'm sorry an auxiliary verb and so can is a, ver a verb that it gets um, uh, combined with another verb like i can do i can go okay i may do or may go so this requires an auxiliary verb so okay. these two do not walks and likes don't okay. so this is kind of a, a, a cheat sheet for doing ox equals yes and ox equals no which works just just as fine um, but when they are Boolean, you can do plus and minus. Okay, so essentially says it must be this tense and it must have this other thing with it. So now we're getting into complex values. Complex values are just these features and these feature sets. And we can build them into what are called attribute value matrices. So this is to me the moment where if you've suffered through learning SQL and databases and those kinds of tables, that you're hopefully this will help because the way I imagine these tables is a, a series of complicated SQL where we have, you know, table one has the um, names and addresses for your clients and table two has their orders tied to your name, their names and addresses. So in one, you have their order, and then the other one, you have their address. And so connecting between these two would be an attribute value matrix. Um, and so they kind of look crazy, uh, personally, but they're essentially lists in lists, this way they're built. So this part of speech for this particular example might be a noun, okay. and its arguments might be that is third person, a, he, she. It's plural, sorry, that would be we. And it's feminine. Okay. 
because this is a way to build a complex set that applies to one, one rule, basically. Okay. Um, and what, oh, sorry, I thought I had more on this. But it's, I do later, but um, essentially this kind of structure requires entire sets to match. So instead of uh, saying that, you know, the part of speech and every one of these rules has to match, you can say just part of speech, but then everything here has to match. So they're, they kind of allow you to cluster related features. Um, I personally think sometimes these are a little confusing because I just like to define all my features singularly, right? Um, so why don't I just define person, number, and, and gender? Uh, but what this actually does is it allows you to cluster ones that should always match together um, and say that this entire set has to match. Rather than saying this one matches, this one matches, and this one matches, you essentially can do it in one quick argument. So this is more of a speed issue. And so uh, the way we build a feature structure is we can use the feature structure function. So we'd say NLTK dot feet structure. Um, and it, it, to me, it looks a little funky because it doesn't, it's not a list, it's not a tuple, it's like a special thing. But you could just say tense equals past, num equals sing, singular. Uh, do remember that these are all defined by you. So you could say numeric out here. Our atomic feature values can be strings or integers. So here they can be numbers or um, strings. Okay, these here I do believe need to be words. And so we can kind of treat this like a dictionary. It's essentially a complex dictionary. So what I'm saying here is that you can do that. And that doesn't really change anything. I'm going to change it back. Um, but if you wanted to say number, make it say number. On your own. Okay. But notice these kind of come up as these like, they sort of look like lists. Because the square bracket is like a list. But it also kind of looks like a, a dictionary. It's not really a dictionary. So it's a kind of a special weird blend of a, of a type of object. So let's start defining things. Number of pe person needs to be three. The uh, norm that makes that third person now can be plural and female. If I tell that to print, it prints like a dictionary. So I can say FSL uh, for gender, okay, for feature structure. One, sorry, that's a one. Okay. Um, I can add to it, so it acts like a dictionary, sort of walks like a dictionary, but it's not a dictionary. <laughs> so it functions much in the same way. I can say it's case here. So I can add things to it and pop things out of it like a dictionary, okay. which means I can now make it even more complicated. So uh, also, if you're more of a traditional language person, like meaning you've uh, worked in like Perl, this is essentially an array. Um, so I can build a feature structure that has uh, where part of speech is a noun, and these uh, complicated arguments are this entire other feature structure. So now you can see that I have to uh, I have two sets of features, basically noun, and then these arguments, and that argument is actually multiple pieces. And the way you pull those out is by using double brackets. So first bracket say give me this argument, second bracket actually give you the second one, because if you notice here, it's within double brackets here. So it's kind of like a list in R, um, where I've got arguments. Um, the person and I told it to print so I got three back. So now we can go to town and really the the, the limiting factor is you. <laughs> Meaning uh, unfortunately English is really freaking complicated so it, sometimes what happens is people are, in, most languages are, I just pick on English because it's my native language, um, but now we have a system where we can start to define those complex rules so that we can create grammatical sentences or break down grammatical sentences and understand their conceptual relations. Um, so here's another way that you can define them. I think the first one makes more sense. 
Sorry, I'm just like really thirsty. Throat is dry. It's all that pollen. Right. Right. So we can build them with these uh, kind of double bracket sequences. I think the first way is a little bit cleaner because you define the interior and then define the exterior, but either way is the same. And so the purpose of this is creating these structures. Let me zoom out a little bit. And I'm going to relate this to business because it just makes a lot of sense to me, where you have some sort of um, uh, entry in a table for each person in your clientele. So you have a line, uh, a column for their name, a column for their phone number, and a column for their age. Okay. Easy enough. So this is a table that you might have like all of your clients. Um, however, you've realized that address is actually a really complicated field. And you've gone international. And the US addresses and the UK addresses and um, I don't, you know, I've shipped things to Australia. They're really crazy. So I need a separate table effectively for um, the way that address breaks down. So address here might even be uh, multiple tables where it's okay, they're in the United States. So here are the here are the requirements for address in the United States. So it's a table for the US. And then okay, they're in um, they're in South America. So here are the, the tables for that. And so it becomes a separate set of features, rules for each uh, built into address. So this might be a separate separate tape, separate second table two similar of words there, um, that denotes the requirements, you know, given the specific key value pair. Okay, address equals US has these rules. Address equals uh, Mexico has these rules. Okay. And then now we can go to, we can go crazy. Okay. So now I can refer to um, separate, I can I can use code now to refer to link two things together is what I'm trying to say. So Kim over here is the spouse of Lee in this example and they have the same address. Uh, so I can address for spouse matches here so I don't have to like I can just connect to them instead of redefining it and cluttering up my tables by having multiple ones. This could be especially useful for times and places where the names don't match. So I get lots of questions. My husband and I have different last names because I like my last name. I kept it. And um, that often comes up, right? So I, I went to the bank today and deposited money. Like, do you have a joint account? I'm like, yes. I'm sorry we have different names, but <laughs> we have uh, our accounts are linked because both of our names are on it. So the address here is just one address. And I can do the same thing with feature grammars is what I'm trying to argue. And so now we can just get more and more complicated. Okay. So uh, subcategorization here, I'm going to take a quick pause. Let me think of how much more we've got. Heads, unbounded dependencies, yada, 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 case and grammar. OK, so since I know there are questions, we're going to get through unbounded dependencies, I think. Should be good. And then we'll save some time at the end for questions, and then we'll have a lot more time next week as well for questions. All right. Um, so to build the best representation of a sentence, we're going to start having to think about um, what combinations are valid and which ones are not, and verbs are the worst. Okay. Nouns, um, determinants, they are pretty much like the, the categories are singular and plural okay. and or other uh, or don't care okay. uh, verbs are the heads of the sentence are the drivers of the sentence and so they also have the most complexity okay. so now we can start to break them down verbs can be intransitive meaning they don't require anything else they can be transitive and require a noun phrase they can be ditransitive and require two noun phrases um, and so we could do that in our, our context-free grammar. Uh, this is essentially adding a simple feature grammar to it. It's not quite context-free anymore. Uh, by doing it this way, 
without the feature structures, we're really limiting our, our ability to then use that data for something else. Because generally the goal of writing these is, is a chat box or um, um, uh, brain fart, that's what it is, or to use that data for something else. So to pull all the data for reviews, for example, code them with this system, and then use this system to pull out the, the sentiment, for just as an example. Okay. So by using this structure, we're limiting what we can do uh, because the categories are nested. Uh, instead, we could start to define them using extra complexity. So verb phrases uh, require some sort of tense and some sort of number. So they might be in the subcategory of intransitive. Okay. So this particular verb uh, for the verb phrase is intransitive, which means it has a tense and it has a number, but nothing else. So see, there's nothing out here. Another option for transitive verbs, it has a tense, it has a number, and a noun phrase. Okay. And those noun phrases might have a tense and a number, but right now we've left it blank. Okay. Uh, the verb here might have might be clausal. Okay, it has a tense and a number, which means it also has an S bar. Okay. S bar means another, another sentence is coming. Okay. Um, and that's essentially the combinations we thought about before, that verb phrases can be verbs only, verbs and a noun phrase, and then noun phrase can be determinants in a noun, or a determinant and an adjective in a noun, or a pronoun, etc. Or it could be a verb and another freaking sentence. But now we've got to clear which one's which. And that approach is called generalized phrase structure grammar, okay, which is a mouthful to essentially denote that it makes it clear what type of verb it is. Okay. And so these are, there's more than this, but these are the main, the transitive, intransitive, di, uh, di, dietive, or ditransitive, kind of your main culprits, um, uh, until you get into verbs that are auxiliary. We've kind of talked about that already. Uh, where you can have two verbs together, or they're clausal verbs that are denoting that you're about to add another sentence on the end. Okay. And that's subcategory option. Here, I don't know that I would call it subcategory, I would call it verb type. But again, these are defined by you. Now we can build examples. So an intransitive verb that is present tense as singular might be disappears or walks. Okay. Um, a, a, and then you might also have to add on here that it's a singular third person. Because right? I disappear, but you dis he disappears. right? So we might have to have even another category piece that here that indicates a third person. A um, transitive option, sees and likes, so you have to have that noun phrase direct object, and a clausal one might be says or claims, and that indicates that another sentence is coming. Okay. We can also do present tense and plural. Uh, he, uh, we disappear, we walk. Okay. Um, and it might even be that for number, the simplest thing might be to do singular, third person, and plural, because third person is a weird combination. Uh, let's see, and then we might do past tense. Disappeared. Notice here how this is a question mark. Because when you get to past tense, the number no longer matters. But we can match this with singular or um, plural nouns. To me, the thing that's missing here is the um, the uh, first person, third person uh, marker because that matters for singular nouns. So S bar just is a subordinate clause. This is the general name for S bar. From a context-free grammar, we might use a comparative or um, I think that's what COP stands for, but essentially a, a word like that. Okay. It's a good indicator that another sentence is coming. Okay. So it's, it's essentially saying that it's a, a, some sort of um, linker and then a sentence. 
And this is where we've talked about how creativity is such a problem for computers because we can have what's recursion, which allows us to say, I think that you think that he thought that we went to the store, which is a perfectly grammatical sentence, may not be totally understandable, but it's grammatical. With a feature grammar, we can deal with this problem. This uh, comp kind of word that uh, allows us to, to now start combining sentences. So we can deal with a sort of sentence issue. Uh, embedded clauses and having multiple embedded sentences in one is what I'm trying to say. So don't forget that the head of a phrase is the first word. So if I back up, the head of this noun phrase is you, the head of this verb phrase is claim, um, the head of this sentence is the noun phrase, which is you, and for the verb phrase, it's this determinant, or I'm sorry, this is a verb, uh, like. Okay. So the head is the first object, the first word. Okay. In a noun phrase, it's a noun, and a verb phrase is a verb. Okay. And the child uh, is the rest of the phrase. I find this wording very funny. But the head of the house, and then the children of the house, or the constituents. Okay. And this is where we can start to build um, entailment where I can connect heads and children together um, to understand the structure better. And so sometimes this is called X-bar syntax, which allows you to see the levels of a sentence. I find this kind of interesting, but I don't know that I think it applies very well for the types of things I think you guys are going to do with this sort of stuff. Um, this is really fascinating to linguists who want to understand visual complexity of sentences, but I don't know if it necessarily adds anything to to what feature grammars already do that help, helps what you guys are probably going to do. Um, but for example, this uh, kind of sentence here has multiple levels. So you can see that it's like broken into multiple sentences. Uh, using the bar syntax, we can see how deep the sentence goes, so to speak. Um, so, for example, this is the old way of presenting a sentence where we have a noun phrase with a determinate and a nominative phrase that's a noun and a pre uh, preposition phrase. Okay. And instead, now what we can do is say, well, it's a noun phrase. Okay, this is two levels up. That's a determinate. And then a noun phrase, again, that's one level up. Here's the noun. And here's the preposition phrase, and we have to break that down into preposition and adjective. Okay. So it allows you to, to look at the depth of a sentence. Okay. Depth often indicates complexity. Okay. And I will tell you how many embedded clauses there are. Okay. And embedded clauses are hard to read because they force your brain to think. Um, and so this sometimes is called phrasal projections, which just to me sounds like the most astrology based silliness like that, like that sound, that might be an astrology phrase, but called phrasal projections. <laughs> um, and once I have them built, I can look at structure. So do the projections have the same structure? Can I create sentences that have um, this embedded clause structure, so you might determine that your chat box can only build two embedded clauses, like no more. And so to do that, you would do this bar level idea, is that like, you cannot go above bar two, or else. <laughs> um, and so if you were trying to create something that sounded like a child, okay, for like a children's game, you might limit their ability, their, the, the computer's creation of sentences to not be complex. So you might use this bar thing to say, not anymore. Okay. And so this is that same sentence. Uh, bar two means it's up two levels. Okay, it's a noun and a verb. Okay. At the second level, it can be a determinant and a noun with another level underneath it. The second level underneath it could be a noun with a preposition phrase that's two levels down, or it could just be the noun at the lowest level. Okay. 
And so we could continue to break down here. We might get stuck. We have to be careful. Recursion rules, remember, can get stuck. Um, or the noun phrase at, at the first level could just be the noun. Okay. So essentially we're, we're allowing it to have this embedded structure, but we might restrict that structure. All right, I think I wanted, yeah, two more slides, and then we'll stop and we'll let you guys have some time for questions. Um, the other big thing we have to consider here is auxiliary verbs. Auxiliary verbs are pain because um, what they are are, um, are um, verbs that require another verb like have, go. Um, uh, go is not the one, am, am, right? I am going, I am sick, you know, et cetera. Um, and then you also have what are called inverted clauses. So we don't always do subject, verb, object. Now that's most of the time, 90% of the time, subject, verb, object. I made that number up, but it's a whole very large proportion of English is subject, verb, object. But every once in a while, we're like, you know what, the rules don't matter, and the points, you know, what is it, and whose line is like, oh, points don't matter, or they're made up anyway. So we just take English and we just like crinkle it up. Okay. So you might invert that. Do you like children? Um, or this really wonky sentence, rarely do you see Kim. Okay. And what we're saying is, you don't see Kim very often, but we're inverting these clauses. Not every verb can be used for an inverted clause. Like I can't say you like like you children, okay. um, but a lot of phrases can can be flipped. Okay. Uh, and so verbs that are part of an inverted frog, an inverted clause, are called auxiliaries. Where did that come from? <laughs> Random synapse firing today. Uh, okay, so auxiliaries. Auxiliaries include do, can, have, will, and shall. And so in that grammar, what we end up doing is just adding a special type of feature for it. Okay, the um, feature is a Boolean. It's either inverted or not. And then what we do is we essentially tell it a special type of rule where an inverted clause has to have an auxiliary verb and then a normal sentence, noun phrase, verb phrase. Okay. So do you like children? And it's considered inverted because there's no first noun phrase. Okay. It's inverted because the verb do comes first. And then a normal sentence. You like children. Okay. And so we're essentially adding this, that a sentence that's inverted um, has an auxiliary verb, and then a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Okay. We don't have to really define the sentences that aren't inverted. Okay. They don't have these they just don't have these features. They don't have the auxiliary verb. 